Yasmin mentioned, I, I usually like to start by introducing myself to the audience. I work in several areas, as, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I have a joint appointment with the Department of Teacher Education. So I belong to Linguistics and Languages, and I also belong to the Department of Teacher Education. And I know that the focus today is on language teacher education. And uh, if, if you're interested in uh, learning more about my work, uh, it's available on these different platforms. So let's start on, uh, with regard to the topic of emotions. Uh, I belong to a doctoral program that looks at second language studies and, and second language acquisition. Uh, we've been looking at emotions for a while. Meryl Swain describes emotions as the elephants in the room, uh, something that's poorly studied poorly understood and often seen as inferior to rational thought. Uh, but the Douglas Fir group have, have also talked about uh, how emotions are very much intertwined with identity, agency, and power, issues that I'm also very much interested in. And all these things are central uh, to the lang learning and teaching of languages today. So earlier in my career, my focus was really on uh, learner emotions. And um, I've worked on several pieces re related to learner emotions, this being the latest one that I've co-authored with my doctoral student. But there's also been a shift in my research focus towards teacher emotions. And I'm showing you this slide to illustrate how the interest in language teacher emotions has grown substantially in the last couple of years. All right, so uh, if you look at a timeline in terms of emotion research. In the early days, uh, the focus was primarily on learner emotions. So we have things like uh, the attitude research by Gartner and Lambert. You might be familiar with the work of Stephen Krash and the effective filter hypothesis. And in the early 90s, uh, Elaine Horwitz really put out a lot of work on learning anxiety. But at the turn of the century, uh, while there's still a very strong interest in learner emotions, um, things started to pivot and uh, colleagues like Jean-Marc De Waal and Anita Pavlenko started to examine teacher emotions. In fact, I would say there are five broad strands in uh, language teacher emotions, um, but today I'm only going to focus on these two, the critical approach and the uh, growing interest in positive psychology. And I'll explain a little bit more about these two uh, developments in, in this presentation. Uh, this is a piece that recently appeared in the Modern Language Journal. So again, an illustration of how language teacher emotions is, uh, as a topic is fast gaining ground. Um, in fact, last year, Cynthia White uh, used the term, the emotional turn in applied linguistics in TESOL in her book chapter that appeared in this book, Emotions in Second Language Teaching. Um, I would place within the larger, SLTE stands for the Second Language Teacher Education Landscape, I would place teacher emotions alongside with research on teacher agency, teacher identity, teacher beliefs, and teacher, teacher cognition. So it's a really a broad field, and you, you have to decide how you want to place yourself in relation to all these other very interesting areas of investigation. So let's start by saying a little bit more about the theories behind language teacher emotions and how we uh, conduct such research. Um, Andy Hargreaves, who, who works in sociology and looks at the sociology of language teacher, or sociology of teacher education, describes teachers as being emotional passionate beings, and, and I think we would agree that any good teacher should be passionate about her work. Um, my former colleague, uh, Thomas Farrell, uh, describes good teaching as a, a very much an emotionally rich enterprise, uh, one that is characterized by passion, enthusiasm, and excitement. But I would like to say that uh, from a cognitive perspective, there's been a decided change also in a shift from learner emotions to teacher emotions. So while the earlier work looked at the psychology of foreign language learners, work done by colleagues such as Jean-Marc De Waal and Dornier, uh, there's also been a growing interest in the psychology of foreign language teachers. Uh, 
and you will hear me talk about Sarah Mercer's work and uh, Jean-Marc Dual's work as well in this presentation. And if you're looking at it from a cognitive perspective, uh, we, we would see emotion as very much an individual trait, one that's internal and individual. And colleagues who work in that area are very much concerned with the relationship between teacher emotions and student learning achievement. Um, but as Parkinson pointed out over two decades ago, such a, an approach fails to take into account how teacher emotions or emotions in general are connected to social and cultural contexts. So if you were to take a social approach to, to teacher emotions, uh, we would say that such emotions are very much discursively constructed. In other words, they're constructed through relationships that exist on a personal, institutional, and uh, social level. So if you look at the micro level, we look at the, the, the level of the classroom, how we connect that to the meso level, one layer up, what goes on in schools, and, and uh, that of course is embedded within a, a macro level context where we have to consider social norms and ideologies. If we were to arrange emotions in a Klein or con continuum, one way to do it is to, to look at it from a cognitive through a social perspective. Uh, what are some topics that are currently uh, hot right now? So one of the things would be teacher burnout, where you, you, you get exhausted uh, because of your teaching, the emotional labor associated with teaching, um, issues related to a neoliberally oriented system, education system, I'll talk more about it in this presentation, and as you've heard me say several times, the, the turn in positive psychology. So I'm showing this slide again to you, again, to emphasize how there has been a strong and, and vibrant interest in teacher emotions in the last several years. Um, Jean-Marc de Waal last year in his special issue claimed that this is the first special issue that's devoted specifically to emotions in second language acquisition. This appeared in the journal Studies in Second Language Learning and Teaching. And um, this book is going to come out very soon. Uh, it's an edited volume uh, done by Christina Kono, Jean-Marc de Waal, and Jim King. And I had the good fortune to co of co-authoring with my two doctoral students, Wendy Lee and Hima Rawal, uh, a chapter that will be appearing in this edited volume. And this is Hima Rawal and this is Wendy Lee. They are my, both of them are my PhD students. And last year, we guest edited a special issue of the journal Chinese for Applied Linguistics that's published by Morton de Greuter. Okay. Um, these were the papers that appeared in the special issue. It's very small in print. Uh, this is something that's slightly larger. Hopefully, you'll be able to see the titles more clearly. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, Sarah Mercer has been doing a lot of work in em emotions uh, recently. Jim King, I showed you on the previous slide. Jean-Marc de Waal as well. Um, but what I do want to say that for today, I'm going to focus on papers four and, pa and five uh, because I myself am, am a, uh, I am a critical applied linguist and I look at issues concerning inequalities um, of power. Okay. So once again, if we were to arrange it in a Klein, uh, colleagues who work within a cognitive perspective would be concerned with how teachers in a way regulate or control their negative emotions in order to enhance their positive emotions. And, and there's also, also been a call to, in a way, to develop emotional intelligence among teachers in, in teacher education. If you were to look at it from a social perspective, uh, you'd be interested in things such as the effects of institutional or governmental policies on teachers' relationships with students, and also you'd be keen to promote teacher agency in order to improve social conditions. So the first paper, that one of two papers from this special issue that I want to talk about is Ju Yong Song. And, uh, and since this is an ELF conference also, uh, the cons the, we, are, we are very much interested in non-native English-speaking teachers, right, in that sense. So as you can see, Ju Yang is uh, of Korean ethnicity. Uh, 
And, and she talks about how NNEST, non-native non -native English speaking teachers, uh, what are their anxiety in relation to um, the work that they do. And she draws on um, socio-political and socio-economic theories, specifically the work of Raymond Williams, Pierre Bourdieu, and Sarah Ahmed. And her point is that emotions are socially constructed. Um, and that, in a way, helps to explain the struggles, the emotional struggles of NNESTs uh, as they deal with structural inequalities. She goes on to say that such anxiety usually stems from hegemonic power relationships. Um, the anxiety they feel is often the result of the reality that English is unequal. Rwani Tupas, a colleague of mine, um, edited a, a, a very nice book titled Unequal Englishes to show that not all varieties of English are the same. So Philippine English is not seen on par with American English or British English, hence the term unequal Englishes. And, and his argument then is that NNESTs, non-native English speaking teachers, ultimately feel some level of anxiety uh, as a result of their so-called incompetence. Okay? Her point then is how do we then improve teacher competence so that they can overcome this self-doubt? Okay, that's her perspective, Ju Yong Sang. And she's published quite a lot on language teacher emotions uh, over the course of her career. I want to spend a bit of time on this paper. Uh, for those of you who, who might not know this, I'm originally from Singapore. And Andrew Pereira is, um, is a colleague of mine in Singapore. I started my career as a high school teacher in, in Singapore. I, I taught English. And so I'm very much familiar with the uh, educational system in Singapore. Uh, in his piece, he looks at how an, uh, an ethics of care is being promoted in the educational system. And I'll say a little bit more about that and what that means. Um, and he was very much interested in looking at the neoliberal agenda uh, that's embedded in um, the promotion of ethics of care. So this neoliberal agenda basically looks at education as a business, right? A profit-making enterprise. Right? And I'll say more again also about neoliberalism later. What he does is he makes the distinction between an ethic of caring and neoliberal caring. If you look at it from an ethic of caring perspective, you're concerned with caring for your students. It's a very genuine care. All right? You want to do what's best for them. Your, their interests are most important to you. But he makes a distinction between this kind of caring with neoliberal caring, where basically, you're working for a school or an institution which presents the image of caring for students, right? And that's because you want to earn the business of parents. So you create this image where you're a caring institution or school. So think about many commercial schools. They have a lot of advertisements and they have images of teachers who appear to be caring for their students. It's different from the genuine caring. And so this is the distinction that he makes between the ethic of caring and neoliberal caring. Um, as I said, um, if you're not familiar with Singapore, it's a very small country, and the Ministry of Education controls a national curriculum, right? There are no private schools. The only private schools are international schools. All the schools in the Singapore education system are managed and regulated by the Ministry of Education. And so what the Ministry of Education did several years ago is it, it was that it promoted the power of care and made it, in a way, the ethical responsibility of teachers. So they framed it in such a way that teachers need to, in a way, nurture socially responsible, value-centered Singaporeans who care for their family, the community, and the country. Um, Heng Sui Kiat, at that time, in 2012, was the Minister of uh, of education. He's now the deputy prime minister and will be the next prime minister of Singapore. All right. How it works in Singapore is language policy uh, comes as a result of speeches made by politicians. So it starts off with a political speech and it works its way into becoming language policy. All right. That's how the, the government works. What's interesting was several years ago, Heng Sui Kiat talked about the need for having every teacher be a caring educator. And then, of course, he asks, 
who are the caring teachers? Well, according to him, if you're a caring teacher, you have to believe in your students, you believe in yourself, you believe in one another, and most importantly, you believe in being part of something, something larger. In other words, um, you always put the community and society before yourself. All right? The purpose of education is to m cultivate young people who will be part of society. And, and therefore, the teacher also always has to put the community before herself or himself. Um, what were the research questions in Pereira's study? And he was interested in looking at these two things. How does the ethic of care shape teachers' emotional subjectivities and beliefs? And how are these caring emotions uh, reflected through the uh, disciplinary technologies of neoliberal accountability regimes? I know that's a very thick question, and I'll try to explain that uh, through the data that he used. So this was part of his PhD, his dissertation, um, work. He analyzed policy documents. He looked at education-related media. So, for example, the Ministry of Education created a recruitment video. In other words, he was trying to attract teachers, prospective teachers, to join the vocation. And if you want to watch the video, it's available on YouTube. Um, he also interviewed teachers. The teachers uh, came from primary, secondary, and, and junior college would be pre-university level. Um, uh, and they watched this video uh, based on Mrs. Chong, this, this teacher. And he used the video as a, a form of uh, stimulation, right? He wanted to stimulate responses and reactions to, from his participants in order to, to elicit their beliefs about teaching, curriculum mandates, educational policy, classroom practices, and emotional uh, experiences. So, as I said, he worked with nine English teachers. And one of the teachers said, of course, uh, was that they were under immense pressure. They had to, in a way, prepare their students for high-stakes national exams. There was a lot of competition among the teachers because in order to be promoted, you need to be seen as doing more than your teacher colleagues. And the fact that they were being evaluated by a number of uh, criteria um, spelled out by EPMS, uh, and I'll say more about EPS on the next slide, but more importantly, I want you to think about this quote from a teacher who said that we feel that we're being, we're being pulled between wanting to please the people who are evaluating me and wanting my students to be happy with me. So you're kind of sandwiched between the, the students whom you have to serve, and, and you also have to respond to, say, your head of department and the administrators and the Ministry of Education. I think most of you understand the situation, right? So they're being torn apart. There's, there's, there's this tension there. This is EPMS, which was an evaluation tool uh, which was used to evaluate teacher knowledge and teacher skills in that sense. And uh, the National Institute of Education is the main teacher education uh, institution in Singapore. Uh, and so this was um, part of the tool. Uh, so s teachers had to perform well in these five areas that were stipulated by EPMS. Uh, what we found was that teachers talked about the tension between their passion to teach uh, in relation to the huge load of uh, administrative duties they had to deal with. Uh, and they, they were torn between wanting to care for their students like parents as opposed to drawing a fine line. At what point do you overcare for your students, right? In Singapore, there are about 35 students in a class. So that's a lot of people to, <laughs> to worry about. And of course, how do we manage this balance between trying to ignite a joy uh, for learning or of learning and preparing your students for national exams? Um, so what ultimately this produced was a great sense of guilt in, in that it took its toll on the teacher's self-esteem, where they feel that they were not doing enough. They worked hard, they worked very hard, but even with all their hard work, they felt that they were not doing enough for their students. All right? So they, they kind of put the pressure on themselves, in a way, uh, as a result of uh, the tensions. And so what Pereira does is that he argues that these tensions arise 
from the neoliberal expectations placed upon teachers. And, and fortunately, the minister did acknowledge that the more caring our educators are, the more stressed they feel. If you don't feel any stress, something must be wrong <laughs> there, right? Uh, you probably don't care for your students at all. You just go to work and do your thing and you, you get out. Um, so that was one study, and I want to talk about another study that, that we've done. This is, again, uh, Hima, who's originally from Nepal, and Wendy, who's originally from China. And this is part of a book chapter that we did titled Teacher Emotions, a Sociopolitical and Ideological Perspective. And then from this perspective, we would look at the unequal power relationships that exist and how these unequal power relationships ultimately uh, affect teacher emotions that are shaped by macro level, meso level, and micro level forces, something that I mentioned earlier to you. And so they worked and they collected the data. They worked with two high school math teachers who taught in schools where English was the medium of instruction. All right? And these teachers were in China and Nepal. The questions were, what emotions emerged from those teachers' interactions with their local contexts, and how did these emotions affect their professional practice? So I'll show uh, very briefly some data from this study. This is Bim, uh, the teacher from Nepal, and he said that in his society in Nepal, teachers have less prestige. They're not really seen as professionals. They're seen to have less value in society. And Bim goes on to say that even in my family, um, family members compare me with my siblings who are less educated, but they make more money, right? Uh, because in Nepal, uh, teaching is not a well-paid profession. And he says that he feels uh, that sometimes he just thinks of just changing jobs in that sense. The teacher from China, Grace, uh, she said that she had to teach to a textbook. So the textbook was the curriculum, basically. And she, and she said the textbook is written in a way that serves the exam. And after doing this over and over again, she got a little bit tired and wasn't quite interested um, because she always had to prepare students for the test. And this ultimate uh, ultimately made her feel really bored with her, her job, and she was just kind of mentally uh, exhausted there. Going back to Bim, uh, another thing that he talked about was the anxiety of having to teach in English. Bear in mind that Bim was teaching math in English, which is not his first language. And that made him very anxious, if you can understand why. And he said, I was very hesitant to teach because I was not very fluent as, as the English teachers in my school, but they hired me because they needed me to, to teach math. I try my best to use English in my classes, but I don't know. When I start using Nepali during class, uh, I think it's okay to use Nepali sometimes because it's easy. And I guess it's easier for the students too to have the teacher speak to them in Nepali instead of seeing him struggle uh, as he tried to explain some math concepts to them in English. So what, this, what did this all mean? Well, we found that uh, emotions are, of course, woven into the lives of uh, teacher language teaching professionals. And a lot of the emotional burnout that we see among teachers uh, stems from the fatigue that they encounter. Maybe there's also a lack of resources and support in the school. And ultimately, we need to think about how values and your ideologies are, are related to your, the teaching prof profession. I've talked about the power relationships and the need to teach to the test. Uh, the thing is this, if your beliefs are in line with the beliefs of your school, good for you, right? There's consonance. But when your beliefs are at odds with the beliefs and ideologies of the school, that's when you have trouble, okay? Then there's dissonance. So the, in the second part of my presentation, uh, I'm gonna kind of say, explore how can LTE, language teacher emotions, how can that agenda be moved forward theoretically, methodologically, and uh, pedagogically? So some theoretical possibilities. Um, as I mentioned several times before, there has been a very strong interest in positive psychology. This is a relatively new book on language teacher psychology. Um, 
uh, guess, uh, edited by my colleague Sarah Mercer um, in Austria at University of Graz and, and, her, and her research uh, assistant. But essentially, positive psychology looks at how do we, in many ways, not only help teachers thrive, uh, not only how do we want to see how teachers not just endure, but we want to focus on how they thrive um, and flourish in the profession, right? You want to do more than just hang in there. You want to move forward, you want to thrive, you want to flourish, you want teachers to succeed. And so, uh, this is a very strong uh, trend that's going on right now. Uh, in their article, or the article by Peter McIntyre, Tammy Gregerson, and Sarah Mercer, they've actually put forward an agenda for positive psychology in uh, SLA. And this is a piece that's in press in the Modern Language Journal. In my own work, uh, this is Dominic Wolf, my former PhD student. Uh, he's originally from Germany. We looked at how we can expand language teacher identity research by also looking at teacher emotions and teacher strategies. So I'll give you a, 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 a summary of this study. This study, as I mentioned, was Dominic's dissertation. And Dominic did a year-long uh, multi-case multi study, and he wanted to look at teacher identity development, and he compared the identities of two native English-speaking teachers and two NSTs, right? And, and specifically, he wanted to see the impact of the MATSOL, Masters in TSOL program, on teachers' development. Today, I will be presenting data on just one of those teachers. Her name is Pooja, and, uh, and she was a teacher from Bangladesh. But these were Dominic's or our research questions. What are the emotional challenges encountered by Pooja, and the, what was their impact on her identity, and how did Pooja's negotiation of emotional challenges influence her pedagogy. So we used narrative inquiry in this piece. I'll give you a little bit of background to Pooja. Now, Pooja had already earned her master's in Bangladesh. She had been working at her university in Bangladesh for several years. She had taught courses such as uh, SLA and psycholinguistics as well. But she, she also won herself or, uh, a scholarship to study in the US to pursue her master's in TESOL. And so by the time she arrived in, in the US, she was about 30 years old, and she was very excited to be there. As I mentioned, this was Dominic's dissertation data, and he followed Pooja over the course of one year. The fall semester, which was the first semester, and the spring semester, which is the second semester. And he, he traced her development as she moved from this course, ESL methods. In ESL methods, we introduce you to the different methods um, associated uh, with teaching. How do you teach grammar? How do you teach vocabulary? How do you teach uh, writing? And then in the second semester, Pooja got to actually put those uh, methods into practice, right? She did her practicum at a community center, and at the community center, she worked with teachers who were refugees and immigrants. Okay, so that's the context. I want to set that up. And the data were included interviews, observations, video recordings, journal entries, and uh, stimulated verbal and written reports. Um, these were the main themes of the study, and I'll go through each of these five themes very briefly. So the first theme was, as I mentioned earlier, Pooja was from Bangladesh. As you know, if you know um, anything of Bangladesh, it's, it's not a very wealthy country, all right? And when she was in Bangladesh, she, she encountered a lack of resources. Um, books for her in, the, in her in a university library were published in the 1970s, for example. And so she didn't have the newest materials available to her. And uh, what was interesting, of course, as, uh, as she grew up, uh, she wanted to become an English teacher, and she felt that now she couldn't live without learning and teaching English. So what was interesting, of course, was Pooja was very excited to be in the US, because now she had access, for example, to the latest materials. She was very excited about having access to electronic journals, among other things. <laughs> 
Okay. And she was invested, and she said that uh, one, of the, one of the things in relation to her confidence was that she was working with refugee and immigrant learners, I told you. Bear in mind that Pooja was also an international student. So even though she had sound grammatical proficiency, her pragmatic knowledge was limited. She was still trying to figure out what is it like to function in US culture, right? So when she was working with the students, she realized that the students were interested in learning about idioms and idiomatic expressions. And that, in a way, placed her beyond her comfort zone because they would ask things like, have you watched this movie? Have you heard this song? Have you watched this TV program? So, you know, Pooja was very busy being a graduate student. She had no time to watch TV. So when they were asking her things like that about American culture, she felt a little uncomfortable uh, in, in that respect. And so she described her change of status as, as a teacher. Because we're back home in Bangladesh, uh, teachers were treated like gods, right? They were really, really respected. Uh, and she had a feeling of power and authority in, in Bangladesh. But now in the US, she felt that she, she was no longer an authority figure. Um, but she had to recast herself as a friend and as a helper. All right, so there was a big, big identity change for her. And, and uh, she also learned, among other things, how to, to uh, in a way, focus on, uh, on a more student-centered approach to teaching. Um, back home, she would never ask professors questions, but here she found that the teachers, her professors were very keen to, to, to answer questions. Um, in Bangladesh, she always gave her students explicit feedback because they wanted explicit feedback. They didn't mind being corrected by their teacher. But in, in the US, she found that she preferred to give implicit feedback so that she wouldn't embarrass her students. So that, you know, there were things she had to negotiate as a result of the different teaching contexts. Um, and finally, she learned to, to balance her, her different identities. The point here is, when we wrote this article, we realized that a lot of the emotion research focused on negative emotions, teacher anxiety, teacher stress, teacher burnout. The fact is, many of us stay in teaching because we like what we do, and that there are many positive things about teaching that keeps us in the profession. So we thought we wanted to tell a, diff a story that was slightly different, a, a study that looked at the positive aspect of, of teaching. And so uh, we were very interested to see how Pooja was able to, in, a, in many ways, turn the challenges into something that was positive. And it became a, a story of resilience in, in that sense. And, and in that sense, we join uh, other people like Jean-Marc De Waal and Peter McIntyre and Matthew Pryor uh, in their call to have more research done on positive emotions and, and to focus on how, for example, teachers successfully overcome obstacles in their work. Uh, this is a, 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 a psychology of language learning conference that will take place next year in Canada, if you're interested. Um, and. Uh, so I want to close here by saying that if you look at teacher emotions, you can look at it in relation to teacher identity and teacher strategies that we have done. But you can also look at it in relation to teacher beliefs, teacher cognition, and teacher agency. You, you don't have to look at teacher emotions in isolation. But I would say you can look at teacher emotions in relation to these other constructs. Uh, I've done a little bit work on, 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 as I said, on teacher identity and emotions. But let's talk a little bit more about neoliberalism. As I mentioned earlier, neoliberalism ultimately looks at education as a business, right? Um, and, and we therefore see the role of education as preparing workers in a way to compete in the global economy. Uh, these are my two colleagues, Joseph Park and uh, Lionel Wee, they wrote a, a very nice book several years ago uh, titled Markets of English. And the three of us have recently collaborated to push forward this idea of linguistic entrepreneurship. Uh, so linguistic entrepreneurship, this is a very fancy definition, basically says that uh, 
Many people now feel a moral obligation to learn more than one language because society, the government, families tell them that if you are multilingual, you're going to be more successful. If you're multilingual and if you know several languages, you're going to be more marketable to employers. Right? So it becomes their responsibility, in a way, uh, to learn more languages. And we've been developing this idea in the last couple of years, and we're working on a special issue of the journal Multilingual right now. Um, but I do want to say, if you're interested in neoliberalism, this is another good resource, Language, Education, and Neoliberalism, by uh, Micha Fulbacha and Alfonso del Percio. And I've written about this together with Wendy as well in the Journal of Asia TAFL. So if you want to do research on teacher motions, how do you go about this business of conducting research? Um, one of the things you might want to think about would be, how do I work in an ethical manner when I'm um, collaborating with teachers? You do not want to get your teacher participants into trouble, right? So that's something you need to be very careful about because they could very well lose their jobs if you report on things that might get them into trouble. So you have to work in a very ethical way. Otherwise, teachers won't trust you as researchers. Something to think about, okay? This is one of my favorite articles uh, that appeared in TESOL Quarterly by, uh, my, by my colleague uh, Suresh Kanagaraja. So Suresh Kanagaraja is a very well-respected scholar, as you probably know. He was the former editor of uh, Tissel Quarterly. He's won all the awards in applied linguistics. But Suresh was originally from Sri Lanka. And in this article, he writes about what it's like being a non-native English-speaking teacher. So as a young man in the 1980s, when he was teaching English in Jaffna, the northern part of Sri Lanka, several experts from the US came to observe him teach. And uh, the long story short was they told him you're a bad English teacher because you're, you're switching between Tamil and English. So Tamil is the language of the community. That was the first language of his students. And, and he felt really depressed after that. Um, then he moved to New York. And the same thing happened uh, about 15 years later. His head of department at the university came to observe him teach. And he said, you're not doing a very good job. But at that, that time, he had already gotten his PhD, and he, he, he wrote a, a counter report to his head of department and said, this is the literature on code switching. And it's seen as a resource uh, in the classroom. So this article is really an autoethnography where he tells his story uh, of, of, about um, what it was like to be a teacher, an English teacher. Uh, so one of the methodologies is you could use autoethnography. That's my point if you want to investigate teacher emotions. Another methodology you could adopt is uh, teacher self-disclosures. What exactly are teacher self-disclosures? I think when all of us teach, we ultimately end up telling stories about ourselves in class. No one just goes into class and reads from a textbook, right? We might talk about our children. We might talk about what we did last weekend. So one of the things you can do is to kind of analyze what teachers disclose about themselves when they're teaching. Okay? And that can be a source of uh, emotion data. This is an article that was published in Language Teaching Research by Martin Lamb and Martin Waddell, uh, where they looked at characteristics of inspiring English teachers. And they found that inspiring English teachers always tended to disclose things about themselves. So if you, if you want a source of data, uh, teacher self-disclosures could be a data source uh, for teacher emotions. So I kind of want to remind you again uh, that when we think about teacher emotions, it's not just something that's an internal individual trait, right? It's something that uh, results as a, uh, because of the power relations that exist, say, between what happens in the classroom and what goes on in the school, and ultimately how society and, and uh, bigger uh, organizations like the Ministry of Education might decide how curriculum is to be implemented in schools. And we need to look at the relationship across all three levels, the micro, the meso, and the macro level. Uh, lastly, pedagogical possibilities. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the idea of praxis, 
and, and reflexivity, but praxis asks you to think about the relationship between theory and practice. So very often in teacher education courses, you're introduced to multiple theories, and they seem interesting to you when you read about these theories. The, the question is, how do you apply those theories into your classroom practice, right? So praxis attempts to merge theory with, praxis, with practice. Okay? And reflexivity uh, is, is about um, how do you reflect critically on your practice, right? Because that's important too. In order for you to grow professionally, you need to also take a step back and ask yourself, what did I do right? But also, what did I do wrong so that I can improve my teaching later? And so people who work from this perspective would say that one of the thing we should things we should do is to develop critical emotional literacies. So Pereira, for example, says that we need to train teachers to understand the processes, practices, and policies uh, that they have to carry out are very much um, underpinned by, among other things, uh, state-sponsored neoliberal agendas, okay? To make them critical of uh, what is happening to them, what's being impressed upon them. Um, I've written a little bit about teacher reflexivity, but I want to say a little bit about this study that I co-authored with two of my master's students. All right, This is uh, Laurel Waller and this is Kinsey Weathers. I teach a graduate course on identity, ideology, and ideology in multilingual settings. And so five years ago, I taught this course, and the course is made up of PhD and master's students. And these two master's students came up to me one day and they said, the readings are very interesting, but we're not sure how to apply what we're reading to the, to the classroom. And I was a bit shocked because to me it was clear, but then I realized after, after they told me that perhaps the readings were too theoretical, right? We were reading about uh, things related to identity and ideology, but maybe I wasn't explaining very clearly how do we bring those readings into the classroom. So what they did was, they said, could we write a paper where we, we describe and elaborate what we've read uh, and, and try to come up with examples on how to implement what we were reading in the classroom? I said, sure, why not? So we had read this book chapter by Margaret Hawkins and Bonnie Norton, which appeared in the Cambridge Guide to Second Language Teacher Education. And in this book chapter, Hawkins laid out five principles. The, the five principles were the situated nature of programs and practices, responsiveness to learners, dialogic engagement, which focused on the student, and the last two principles focus on the teacher, reflexivity and praxis. So what, what Kinsey and Laurel did was they ended up coming up with examples. And so they said, oh, this idea of reflexivity how exactly do we carry out reflexivity in the classroom? And they said maybe one of the things we could do is to conduct peer observations, where, for example, you have a fellow teacher, your colleague whom you trust, sit at the back of the classroom, and there's a camera there, for example, and maybe you record your own teaching and then do an analysis or debrief of the lesson. Uh, in that sense, you would help develop your, your reflexivity. And, and the other thing, of course, uh, we, they, they, they said is that we need to kind of think about how we can uh, uh, combine our understanding of theory with, with actual uh, practice. So I know this, you, we've talked about the different uh, Erasmus Plus projects. I know that this project is kind of almost done in that sense. Maybe for the next Erasmus Plus project that you will uh, <laughs> develop, you might want to look at language teacher emotions. Right, in that sense. Um, how do English teachers in Turkey, for example, deal with the different kinds of emotions that, that they encounter when they teach? So on that note, I'm gonna wrap up and, and kind of summarize and say theoretically, these are some things to think about, uh, neoliberalism and positive psychology. Uh, methodologically, you might wanna think about the ethics involved in doing teacher research. Uh, you might want to explore your own experience through an autoethnography or analyze the self-disclosures of teachers. And um, pedagogically, you might think about um, how praxis and reflexivity uh, can be developed in the classroom. So I want to say this and remind you that, uh, to, to, to always love your English teacher. And I thank you once again uh, for your attention. <laughs>